So here we are. I want to discuss now constant energy surfaces and an effective mass tensor for real materials. All right, that's again in the context of having calculated band structure, and I interpret it in the EK diagrams. And let's look at it again as a multidimensional data representation where we want to uh, have contours of density. So here, again, we look at uh, uh, germanium. We look at the L point here. And uh, what we see is we have a minimum point out here and a minimum point that corresponds in the Brion zone, uh, a minimal point there. We also know that there's eight of these kind of surfaces here in this structure. And that is what you would get if you plot it in a slightly different way. So there's eight ellipsoids that are uh, bisecting uh, the Brion zone edge. When I, and when I say bisecting, I mean only half of the uh, ellipsoid is actually inside the first Brion zone. The other ones here, other components of it, are actually in the neighboring Brion zone. Okay? So you could say we have eight of those ellipsoids, but only half of those are inside the Brion zone. The other states are repeated effectively. Okay. Now for silicon, we have something similar, where it, uh, for silicon we have a minimum point that is on the delta line at x, but it's not exactly at the zone edge. So these ellipsoids are now actually inside the Brion zone. Here on the plot for gamma, uh, for germanium, it's harder to see that because the Brion zone is not being shown. But as I mentioned in the previous slide, only half of the volume of these um, ellipsoids is inside the Brion zone. So um, here we go. We have these uh, um, equi uh, energy surfaces, uh, constant uh, dispersion uh, surfaces in uh, germanium, you have eight of these uh, valleys. In germanium, you have six in the conduction band. In gallium arsenide, you have one that's uh, like a perfect sphere. All right. Now, let's lay out the equations for such ellipsoids. Certainly, the equation for a perfect sphere is pretty simple. You have a dispersion that is a, has a band offset and then uh, is a function of k1 square, k2 square, k3 square with the same coefficient up front that'll be related to the effective mass of this material. And then these two materials that have a true, uh, more of an ellipsoid dispersions are described by uh, the equisurface of an, of an ellipse. So you have one long axis, so to speak, or longitudinal axis, and two transverse axes like this. All right? So, as I mentioned, that is, of course, going to relate us to some um, effective masses that we had defined before. So here we go. We're going to use the expression to calculate the inverse of an effective mass as the second differential of a dispersion. Now, this is really a tensor because this is a an uh, object that can vary in, as a function of uh, uh, three coordinates. And uh, for a spherical object like this, this is very simple. There's three identical masses in the three principal directions, and there's no cross terms. Okay? So, there, um, so it's a diagonal tensor, and the diagonals have exactly the same value. All right. Now, if we consider this ellipsoid for silicon and for, uh, for germanium, we have the longitudinal component and we have two masses that are the transverse uh, components. And also for this ellipsoid, a line in the uh, principal axes, we have no crossover terms. So again, it's a diagonal tensor. That means that the force and the movement are aligned with each other. Okay. All right. Here, these two are uh, the one corresponds to a typically a heavy mass that's in the longitudinal direction. Sometimes also uh, the heavy electron 
And in the transverse masses, they, these are smaller. They're also sometimes called light electron masses. And as I mentioned, we have in germanium, we have eight valleys and in silicon six, and we have to account for those down the line as well. Now, valence bands are a completely more complicated uh, piece of art. And uh, uh, I'm just going to walk through it uh, very briefly. Uh, in general, we make approximations to them in the fundamentals course, and we get into the details of valence bands much later. So here what you have is a, uh, a valence band um, depiction, in this case germanium, but any of these materials uh, you will expand them in a form of a constant energy surface like this. This is typically done with something called a k.p method. You can do similar things with a, a tight binding method. And what you end up having is dispersions where that couple X and Y, Y and Z, and Z and X. So these are rather complicated dispersions. The materials have their own coefficients A, B, and C. And uh, what you, the take-home message you want to have here is that there's three bands. There's something called a heavy hole band here. There's a light hole band here. And as I mentioned before, there is a split-off band that is in energy further away from the heavy and the light hole band. Now, in an ideal world, you would like those bands to be perfectly spherical. But with these uh, couplings here, the light hole and heavy hole are not isotropic. They are not spheres and there's strong spatial variations. In fact, the isosurface of uh, uh, a heavy or light hole might look more like this. So, uh, you might say, oh, that looks disastrous, and we'll show you methodologies later to approximate this thing into a sphere and just deal with it in, as a sphere. But there's also tech, really technical relevant uh, innovations that come out based on this um, anisotropy. So my best friend, Chris Bowen, when he was at TI, he invented the rotated substrate technology that made PMOS, uh, whole MOS devices, uh, have very strong performance uh, without applying strain. So that was an invention in uh, ballpark 2000, 2001, and it had real impact on real, real transistors. So understanding these dispersions from a very fundamental way is actually very critical. All right, so now that we have these constant energy surfaces and a complicated mass tensor, we're going to try to find ways to simplify these things so we can cast them into a form of device analysis where we can kind of forget a lot of the details, at least in terms of immediate application. A lot of these uh, fundamentals here that we are covering at the beginning of the course, you will need to know as you dive into further devices, especially um, more sophisticated devices at the nanometer scale. So in the next section, I'll talk about density of states, effective mass, where we map these complicated ellipsoids into spherical objects and uh, get approximate uh, effective masses that we can calculate um, a density of states, etc., more easily with. So that's in the next section.